people who live here in Smyrna, Tennessee are quite familiar with the house you see there behind me. It served as the childhood home of one of Rutherford County's most respected Civil War soldiers. Sam Davis was a, a young man, like a lot of young men. He was born in 1842. He uh, went to a military school right around the fall of 1860 like a lot of these other young men did because they didn't know which direction the country was going. They were, they were scared and they were doing this sort of thing. Um, so he was there for about two semesters, or one, maybe one semester and a half because war broke out. He came back, told his father Charles that, you know, I'm gonna join this. And he joined up with a group called the Rutherford Rifles under the Army of the Tennessee and fought in several battles. You know, he fought, at, he fought down the road at Stones River. He fought at Shiloh. He was involved in Stonewall Jackson's march up in Shenandoah Valley before that. He was injured and took some time off in late 1862 and came back as part of a scout group called the Coleman Scouts. And in doing that, you know, he was scouts. They go across the country or across the the local, the local countryside mm -hmm. and try to find out, find out information on enemy troops. And unfortunately, he was captured right outside of Pulaski in an area called Minor Hill with some papers in his boot along with newspapers that were from the Union area. So after he was captured, they really wanted to find out who he got those papers specifically from, not the newspapers, the papers that were in his boot. And to do that, General Grenville Dodge, who was in command of the group that had him, wanted to put pressure on him to give that up because these papers came from Dodge and he was pretty upset about this. Mm -hmm. So what happened was he decided to try Sam as a spy, which carried a sentence of death. Sam would not give up this information to the point of them asking him while he was on the gallows one more time and he still would not give it up. So he was unfortunately hanged seven days after he was captured. And see, the thing is why he's called the boy, the boy hero of the Confederacy he was only 21 when this happened. So that's, that's kind of the gist of Sam. Now, obviously the family heard about this, and of course back then you had the fog of war. They didn't know for sure that it was Sam, but they knew that a Coleman scout had been hanged. So they sent a man named John Kennedy, in relation to the president, of course, along with Sam's younger brother to go and find this out. And unfortunately it was Sam, they brought him back here. He was buried directly across from our entrance here, and then after the war, his mother wanted to move him close to her, which was the garden out back. And he was buried there around 1867. We like to ballpark it around then. And that's where Sam still is today. What was his famous quote right before he tragically lost his life? If I had a thousand lives to give, I would give them all rather than betray a friend or my country. So you can see why so many people considered him a hero, I would have to think. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Of course, where we're standing now is in the home, his, his childhood home, I guess, actually, well, isn't it? Yes, this is his childhood home, and we also have the house where he was born on the site, but it was not original to this location. This location is the house that he spent most of his years in. His dad's name was? Charles. Charles, Charles Lewis Davis. And this was a plantation? Yes. As far as the house is concerned, let's talk about maybe the different rooms in the home and like when visitors come here to see, mm -hmm. what can they expect to see? Like, let's say we'll start on the, on the ground level. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, we have the formal parlor, which is going to be the main meeting room where you have your guests and you sit and chat and do a lot of the similar things that we do now. You know, now we, we like to joke about not gossiping, but we do. You know, they talk about news items of the day. They would sit in there, they might take a drink or something, but that was where they would start out. Now, if there was a large gathering, they would start out in that room, then they would spill over into the informal parlor, which is where, at some point in the night, the ladies and the gentlemen would usually split up. The ladies would go in there. That room also has a guest bed in it, which is where their, their guests, usually family, would sleep. Mm -hmm. And if there were any single male guests, then they would be upstairs in the singular guest bedroom on the boys' side of the house. But the way the house is arrayed, there's a boy's side and a girl's side. So after you leave the informal parlor, there's a step down indicating the new part of the house. Then you come into the room that we're in right now, which is the parents' bedroom. Now, one thing that you'll notice as you go through the house is that decorating-wise, the formal, the informal, mm -hmm. the dining room, and the front hall, those rooms are going to be more decorated than the others because those were the rooms where guests would be. The other rooms, not so much. They were just for family. They would, be function they would be functionally decorated, and they might have nicer things in those rooms, but it's just stuff that they're using for themselves. 
Now the upstairs you have the boys' side up front. That's going to be where most of the boys slept. Now there were eight boys, seven of them making it to adulthood. Because of their age differences, they weren't all in there at once. Mm -hmm. We like to even say that some of them actually slept out on, on that front porch, the sleeping porch up top. Now you come down the stairs and come through the informal parlor and come up through the back side. That's going to be where the girls' side of the house is. And if you make a right, that's going to be where the older girls' room is. And the window that looks out into the front of the yard purportedly is where Jane actually saw Sam's casket coming up the road. And according to her daughter, Andromedia, Sam's younger sister, uh, who's given us lots of interviews that we base a lot of our information on, Jane actually fainted in front of that window when she saw Sam's casket coming up the road. Now, Jane is his mother? Yes, Jane, Jane Simmons Davis is his mother. And... Charles and Jane, Sam was their first child. So you can imagine how important that was to Jane. And then the next room you come across is going to be grandmother's room that's directly above us. Uh, her name was Elizabeth Collier Simmons. She was Jane's mother. And she actually came down with the Davises from Virginia when they made that trip. We ballpark it around 1825. And she has a lot of items that go with crafting because she would be the one that would have taught the Davis girls how to do these things. The quilt that's on the bed, she actually made herself. Okay. And then the next room that's in the very back upstairs is going to be the little girl's room. And the little girl's room is interesting because you can kind of look at it and see how they prepare people for gender roles. There is a small sewing machine in there that's original. Uh, that, was for adding, that was for adding seams to pants to extend your pants and make your clothing last longer. Okay. They would also, that room would also serve as kind of a nursery whenever family came from Far, far off and had their little kids, even their little boys, stay up there with them. Okay. The older Davis girls, along with grandmother and the little girls, would kind of help in taking care of them, so it would kind of gear them towards learning what they were going to do later in life. Was it common in those years to have the homes basically separated because of gender? Uh, yes, it was, a, it was a Victorian hang-up. Now, as you know, Queen Victoria, she was the trendsetter in this time period in both Western Europe and America. So that was something that they did and it was it was functional. Mm -hmm. Also you notice the the male guest room. As you go through the house, it's gonna be harder to get to the girls' side of the house, even with the little girls' room being at the very back. You can understand how far it would take, how long it would take to get to there going through the house if it's like an intruder situation. But I mean that wasn't that was something that was in the back of their minds, but it was always there, security wise. But the main reason was the the Victorian hang ups that they had. This home is close to 200 years old. Would, would you say it's still in pretty good condition considering? Yes, uh, they did definitely build things to last. Uh, back then, that was the standard. You know, people always say, well, they don't build stuff like they used to. People still do build stuff like that back then. They just cost a whole lot more. Uh, but back then, this was the standard. So homes built in this time period, if they were not interfered with at any point in time or encountered any maledictions that you would think, they last a pretty good while. As far as the other buildings that are on the grounds here besides the main home that we're currently standing in, what are the other uh, buildings here on, on the grounds? All right, so behind you out here we have the kitchen that is fully functional. It has several artifacts from the family in it. Then next to it we have the, uh, the smokehouse, which can hold up to 3,000 pounds of meat. You know, this family did grow several different types of crops, but their, one of their main sources of income was actually from hogs. So you have the smokehouse, and then in between it, you have an outhouse, though the outhouse is here for interpretational reasons. Wouldn't have been anywhere near this close to the house back then, just for obvious reasons. Now, back this way, you have the overseer's cabin, who, and this was an original building where the Davis's overseer would have, wor would have worked and done his business. Now, there's no bed in there, because most of the time, he would have, he would have rode on a horse to work, because he was a neighbor. And then beyond that, we have four cabins that we interpret as cabins for the enslaved persons that lived and worked here. Uh, you have the dog trot, which is the larger of the two, it's the larger of the four. It's connected by one single roof. This is mainly for heat reasons. So you can cook in one side, and then you can make the other area your living space. This also helps with ventilation because you have the flow through. And you also notice as you go through the house, the big windows, they pop these windows open. This is how these homes would ventilate themselves in the, in the era before air conditioning. And three of those buildings, we believe, are from the Rattle and Snap Plantation. And the dog trot that I just mentioned, that is from the Las Casas area close to Murfreesboro. 
When people come here for the first time, what is, what is usually their reaction when, when they see the home and the grounds, everything combined? When they see the front of the house and they're going through the house, they usually say, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was, mm -hmm. simply because the house is made with the L-wing, so it's deeper than it is wide. Mm -hmm. So it kind of surprises them. Um, just the beauty of the site, especially if they come in spring when everything's in bloom or in fall, mm -hmm. when the colors are just everywhere, that's actually my favorite time of year. But the, just the overall size of the site, you know, we have the creek running beside us, mm -hmm. and in the fall, the cotton's in bloom. So, I mean, that's, and we're one of the few places in the area where we actually have cotton on the site. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's always, that's always something that kind of sticks out with people. If you would like to visit the Sam Davis home, the address is 1399 Sam Davis Road in Smyrna. There is also a museum on site where you can see many interesting artifacts about Sam Davis, his family, and the plantation. The current hours of operation are Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. There is an admission charge. Reporting from Rutherford County, Barry Hyatt, NCTV.